Steve, August Fulcher, Gadi, and Fela Lachita. Hello, and welcome to Dingle Lit today. To Anor Hasurum, a very kind lesson filler, Mary O'Donnell. I'm very happy to be speaking to the poet Mary O'Donnell today. To introduce Mary, I'd just like to read to you a quote from her latest book, Massacre of the Birds, in which Kevin Myers says, As a poet, Mary O'Donnell stands with Heaney and Boland, Kavanagh and Clark. As a living writer, she stands alone. As you can imagine, we're delighted to have her here at Dingle Lit, and in particular myself, as I think the, the common interest we have is empowering women's voices. Um, she was writing in the Irish Times last year and stole a quote from James Joyce, which said, our highly hypocritical, secretive, illiberal and anti-female Irish society needed a good critical mirror held up to itself. I wanted to be one of those who did that. In her writing, Mary does this, and I'm really excited to talk to her today about how. Hello, Mary. Hi, Diana, and uh, it's great to be here at Dingle Lit Festival, and thanks to you and Nicholas and Sheila for all the assistance you've given. It's really great to be here, if not down in Dingle. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you because, as I said, our, our common interest and one of, the, one of the many themes that you touch on in your new book, Massacre of the Birds, is women, women's voices, women's experience in the world. And what is so interesting, I'm sure to longtime fans of yours who will all be familiar with your poem, Unlegendary Heroes, is that you've updated it in this book with a new poem called Finding Our Place Heroic. And I'd love you to talk to a little bit about why you did that and why you felt now is a good time to do this update. Okay, well, Unlegendary Heroes was the title poem of my 1998 Salmon collection. And um, I'll just put that in context. Um, so that's what, 22 years ago. Um, I had been reading um, a 1938 folklore survey of to record the local people who occupied South Ulster. And some of the achievements were recounted, you know, about men's lives, like Patrick Farrell of Laca, who was able to mow one acre and one rude Irish in a day, or, John Duffy Corley was able to dig half an Irish acre in one day. And there was a series of these sort of achievements, including a fellow who could stand on his head on a pint tumbler or on the rigging of a house. So I thought, OK, yeah. where are the women? And I, I was thinking of the past in terms of a labouring past in the 40s, 50s, 60s in rural Ireland. So I invented, I suppose, an inventory of female labour that I wanted to set imaginatively in that period. So I'll just read maybe two pieces to give you a sample from the old poem. Kathleen McKenna, Anna Gola, who was able to wash a week's sheets, shirts and swaddling, bake bread and clean the house all of a Monday. 
Birdie McMahon of Falkland walked to Monaghan for a sack of flour two days before her eighth child was born. Now, sometimes when I would read this poem, people would start tittering at this. Um, but in fact, I wasn't trying to be comical at all. I think that we have lost touch with the Herculean physical labour that men and women did years ago. Um, and um, there's another one, Dora Houston Stranani, died in childbirth, aged 14 years. Last words, mammy, oh mammy. So there's this inventory of female achievement from that period. And I was thinking just last year, well, Ireland has changed, mm. I mean, radically in those 22 years in terms of access to certain rights and certain, you know, we now have all kinds of legislation that make it more possible for people to live in their diversity. Uh, and that includes gay men, of gay couples of men and women, um, and all sorts of other things to do with reproductive rights. So I thought I would have another go at it. And, um, you know, um, so it's called Finding Our Place Heroic. And I'll just read a small section. Again, it's an inventory but it's today's world. Katie O'Toole, Carberry, rises at six, dresses infants for creche, fills washing machine, slow cooker set for 7 p.m. Monday evening. Jessica Macken, Kildangan, her words flow early morning, her tapping keyboard. Outside, the wind cracks the birch branches. Molly Malloy, Kildangan, raves quietly after a morning of minding her mother, will marry Jessica Macken next April. And then June Devlin, Ballyvarney, begs on Grattan Bridge, has twins in the rotunda, cries, Mammy, oh Mammy. And finally, Sorka, Fiery, Fairview, three jobs to pay for college, fries burgers, trains for the Liffey swim. So I wanted to reflect the, um, I suppose, the wide range of activity and some of the changes as well. It's less rural, but and even when it is rural, it is more connected to the globe to globalization now as well. But there's still a, poverty. A little bit about your process in writing this poem. Were you trying to encompass a really uh, every every aspect of society in it? Did you? Or did it kind of come free flowing to you? Um, I, I think it's a bit of both. It did flow freely enough. You know, I, I think I have a sense of the, you know, the, the widespread of the way we live now, the, the differences between people who, I mean, there are so many people, if I even think of the road on which I live, outwardly, we all look the same, but of course, we're radically different and we're living very different lives. I'm sure of it, you know, um, so it's the same. And um, I, I think that that is the same. So I was just um, again, I was imagining how it might be. I find it fascinating. There's such a glimpse into I mean, even though each sort of little character in it has a, a two or three lines there's such a glimpse into a whole world in those two or three lines it's like you've taken a novel and compressed it to a novella compressed it to a poem compressed it to a, a whole film even you know but you get this sense of that character so much even in those two or three lines I'd love to, to hear a little bit about how you find and do you think you'll want to write more novels how do you find the difference? I will. Them? Yes, I, I am in the process of writing another novel at the moment, but it's uh, I began it last March, shortly before lockdown. And um, then it, it stalled in late summer. I suppose I got tired and I knew there were problems with it. So I put it aside, but I hope to come back to it soon. And I'm taking my time with it. Um, and um, and also I found I was still writing poems and I can't do both. It's one or the other. So I have to commit fully to whatever genre I'm writing in, you know. A lot of, a lot of writers have said over lockdown that even though they had, you know, all this time, which you think would make you more productive, as you really can't do anything else, there was also a sense of not being able to, to produce work, that it was very, very difficult and actually harder to work during lockdown. Did you find that? Um, I, I didn't really at first. Uh, because, you know, 
especially last spring when the weather was so good. I, I had an appetite for working hard in the morning and then being free in the afternoon. But, you know, and those the days were long, but it, it's more difficult now. And that's simply because of lack of social interaction and missing people uh, because you know being being with the rest of our tribe it stimulates us it keeps us connected and it is so necessary so um not having that is can be a bit problematic at times yeah i want to to move on to another poem in this collection which i find incredibly arresting and and moving and it is, um, it wasn't a woman. And I think especially when we talk about lockdown in Ireland, there's been a huge surge in domestic violence. There's been a huge surge in women's lives being much more difficult. And this poem touches on a lot of themes that are, are difficult and reflect issues within women's lives. And would you like to read a little, a little some or all of it for us first? Okay, before? well, I mean, basically I like most people, I want a world in which women and children are never beaten or violated or injured. So it's, a, it's a quite an uncompromising poem. It wasn't a woman who used a stick to abort the baby in an 11 year old girl, who gang raped a 14 year old, who opened a woman to a room of shamrock green rugby shirts, later texting about spit roast and sluts, who gave money to a rag picker took one of her five children to a faraway brown dust city who sold her on to the businessmen. It wasn't a woman who beat the child with an iron bar so that vertebrae were crushed. It wasn't a woman who ruptured the rectum of a small boy, who broke the vagina of a baby girl. It wasn't a woman who scalded a wife because she spoke to another man, who flung acid in the face of a girl who did not want to marry, who poured caustic soda on a wife's genitals in a quiet Irish town. It wasn't a woman who broke a nose, blackened an eye, bit a cheek so that the marks of those teeth are telltale pits in the skin and her breasts are purple and green. It wasn't a woman who punched the baby out of her so she bled to death. It wasn't a woman who smashed photo frames and threatened and perfume bottles, who kept a gun beside the bed and threatened to use it, who blamed her even as he punched her, roared the rhythms of cunt face, cunt face, cunt face, because it helped hit her harder. It wasn't a woman. It wasn't a woman. It wasn't a woman. It is, um, you know, I, I don't understand why, and I know most men that I speak to about this don't get it. I don't understand why men themselves do not become more politicized about this issue. I fail to comprehend it. I've, dis I've discussed it with many men and why not? Why are the good men not also responding? Because it could be their daughters, their sisters, their mothers, their wives. It's uh, and it, I've always felt that feminism doesn't work if only women are feminists. And like that, it's an issue that men need to be on board with in order for society to change. But I have to say, just even listening to you reading that poem, I think it's um, it's very affecting. And it's like it's like hearing all of the all of the bad things in one go. It's it's so powerful. Um, and it's what I hugely admire about your work is that you are very unflinching in attacking subjects that aren't easy to talk about that might make some people blush to read that poem. And I'm, I'm apologize if anyone had small children in the room, we probably should have given a warning before. We, but uh, it, uh, it is- all, so, all language is good language. Um, I, I wrote that on my daughter's dictionary years ago. There is no such thing as a bad word. It depends how it's used. Yeah. And I think you're using it in a, in a very powerful way there. I mean, it's, it's a way that literature and poetry can affect change. I think that, it, okay. you know, if, if it affects people. Yeah, I hope so. Um, I think as well in your work, so much of it centuries on women. You've, uh, you've some of your poems, and I know we don't have time today to go into all of the poems we want to, but you know, I've noticed in reading it, you you bring up the subjects of your mother and your aunt and death and dying. 
um, in a very powerful way. How much of an influence have the women in your life been on your work? Um, I suppose they have been they have exerted a, quite an unconscious influence because I've had to I have been connected to both my my late aunt and my still living mother in terms of their care. So uh, this is a world that I have discovered in the last, say, five to seven years in particular. And um, it, it's quite common to lots of um, older women now and older, some older men also to be caring for very older people. And um, so you, you, lear you learn more on life's glorious path <laughs> about how to do so many things. Um, but um, it is, well, it's not always easy. Um, I think it's something that maybe isn't talked about enough or, or supported enough in our society, but it's certainly, it comes through very strongly in these poems, those, I suppose, reflections on aging and mortality Yes, uh, yes. Um, you know, the, the thing about um, mortality, say, you know, I, I, one, one uh, thing which really struck me was after my father died, my mother grieved for about three years and she wrote what was called, what she called her sorrow diary. Uh, that was her form of therapy for herself. That's how she handled it, you know, and um so yeah, I have been very conscious of all that, that whole pattern for quite some time now. And of course, it's not always gloomy. Sometimes it's quite funny too and amusing, you know. You mentioned in one of your poems, actually, the, the Sorrow Diary and that she, she never said a bad word about any of her children in it, wasn't it? No, no. Will I read that one on reading my mother's Sorrow Diary? It, it won the, the Orbis Reader's Prize a few, three years ago. Um, it's called, yeah, on reading my mother's sorrow diary. And I, I read it, but I told her I'd read it. And she said that was fine. Um, the, and she went to a counsellor who told her God wanted him. And she said, I wanted him more and left. The diary was the thing labelled sorrow. No laughter in these pages. Double underlined. I expected smoking syntax, tirades against her daughters. Instead, she wrote of loss the felling of trees, herself split in two, and feeling useless, but happy when we visited, happier still if we were happy. She despised the holiday with us, her idea. Never again to a car journey from Malaga to Jerez, filthiest town I've ever seen. And she'd scream if my husband attempted Spanish one more time. His gracias, senors, alarm bells of grating over eagerness within the fortress of her well-travelled knowledge. Mostly, she wrote from day to day. A good day. Did some shopping. God, when will this end? When will we be together? She blessed us, her daughters, her paper refused harsh words. What there was scrupulously overlaid with her code. An apple, an apple, an apple. The surefire way to make illegible. We remained her lovely girls. No slight to us, while even in grief she edited herself. I want to move on to another poem now. Muse, which I think was one that is very important to you as well. Do well, you want to give yeah. a little bit of background to this one? Yeah, well, I, I suppose when I read Ted Hughes's The Thought Fox, uh, this is a poem which his poem is really about the whole process. It is about the process of poetry and how a poem comes to you. And um, I, I found when I read that, I thought, yes, I, I, you know, something pinged in my mind. And I thought, yes, I, I get that. And I, I have my own, um, I suppose, thought fox, but it's like a satyr in the garden. So I just, and it's just called Muse. He lives in the wild brackens beyond the garden. I must stay alert, alone, resist the cosmetic clatter of an evening of too many useless acts. Pointless to tempt him with inscribed saucers of scallops, marbled blue cheese, or the omega of bone marrow. His appetite is not sated on such fine produce. 
as he springs silently, rank as a goat, through the, through the rime frost and a chink in the porch window. I inhale the funk of him, sense his stealth, have known it all my life. He stands at my back, caresses my arm, the one that cramps with the pain of staying put, his one silver hoof tapping a line, a rhyme on the floorboards. He scarcely whispers, yet bothered by his absence these sullen months I hear him clearly. Hush now, he says, I have broken the fences, the safe arbours that restrained you, have torn down the walls that bound you to silence. I twitch to answer, accepting his hand curl around mine. In an instant, our fingers shift across the moonlit desk. So it is about sometimes feeling as if one is um, guided by something outside the self that one is connected to, obviously. I mean, people experience this um, in, they experience it sometimes when they pray. Uh, they experience it sometimes when they're out in nature. And it's probably where my, my spirituality lies in that kind of a pagan setting, really. Interesting to bring up nature. I think there is uh, so much inspiration has been found in nature by poets. You and Ted Hughes both felt that a, an animal was sort of your muse. Mm -hmm. And then this book, you know, you, you deal also with themes of the environment and nature in it. And of course it is called Massacre of the Birds. And where that title came from was actually inspired by some of the threats to nature, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, it was. I, I read um, a, it was a quotation from Newsweek magazine that said that of, of the five billion birds that fly south over the Europe and the Mediterranean to Africa every year, up to one billion are killed by humans. Up to one billion. It's a phenomenal number. And, you know, they're killed in all kinds of awful ways, really. Um, I don't know if this, if you want me to read that or if there's time, but... Um, We'll not keep it in. Yeah, if you okay. like. All right. So it's it's the full title is A Husband's Lament for the Massacre of the Birds. He does this by counting, he does this by digging. Oh, loss, loss, for the swallows have not returned. Loss, for the neap tide shows no sand piper, nor green shank, and he digs the garden to plant what will attract all comers of wing. All are welcome in his green field, the swifts that have not returned to crisscross the sky, pigeons long shot and bagged, and songbirds that in Europe are vanishing, glued, poisoned, trapped, so that the full-bellied can dine in a rustic restaurant in Tuscany. He welcomes too in his garden dream the fan-tailed warbler, glued to death in Cyprus in an agony of open beak, chaffinch, black cap, quail and thrush. Oh, loss, loss as the songs die and little throats close against the final mutilation. He will continue to prepare each year this place for the birds and surely a man can beat his chest and cry out to his neighbour. Let us bellow in rage, let us bellow in sorrow, let us plant these spaces to make havens for the hunted. Do you think that the environment and the destruction of the environment is a theme that it, it comes across strongly in this book? Yeah, I suppose there are maybe four or five poems that certainly hit on it, but I, I wasn't trying to make it a big theme. The, the, the poems just came to me naturally, I suppose. I, I was moved by certain things. Um, and I think that many writers everywhere are probably responding at the moment in this way to some extent in their work. You can see it and you can see it in visual art as well. Um, and... Uh, probably it is it's not a, the most visible way of pushing back but I believe in the drop in the ocean in life and I think that everything we do to resist the eradication either of species or languages or diversity you know is worth the fight 
I, I mean, when we discussed before before this meeting, what poems you would read, there, there are so many, obviously, I can tell that you feel a deep affection for in the book and that it was a very hard decision to choose which ones to pick. What was it about that particular one that made it the title poem for the book? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, I don't know, it seemed the one that was, um, it seemed to have the urgency that I wanted, probably, you know, something like that, something like that, I suppose. Um, I have lots of questions coming in here from, from viewers and listeners, so I'm going to maybe ask you some of these um, of and then we'll have a final poem or two then at the end. All right. I'm sure people right. have their questions heard because I know that is what is special about having a festival is to be able to interact with the author, so I, I want to give the questions some time. So, um, Mary, one, one question is where or how did you first get published, if you can cast your mind back? <laughs> Oh, oh it was a long, slow path with many of my contemporary male poets being published before me. Um, so um, that, that is the truth. Um, mm. But eventually I bumped into Jesse Lendeni. I mean, I, I published in the little in the literary magazines for years since my 20s, really. And um, but I was in my mid 30s before the book came out. Um, uh, I think 1990, I think that was. And had I, I mean, I bumped into Jessie Lendeni and she, she just said, I'll publish you in the way she does these sort of things. And, you know, she, it has been a very good experience. This is my fourth book with Salmon, though it's my eighth collection. Um, so, you know, it takes stamina. Um, if you're just beginning, concentrate not on full book publication. That's my advice. Concentrate on just developing your work slowly and, getting published in the better, the better journals like Southward and Poetry Ireland, The Stinging Fly, um, Cranog, um, The Tangerine in, in the North. You know, there, there are good, some good journals and go for those. Ciphers is another one. And um, you build up muscle over time. Excellent. So another question then is, Mary, you spent time teaching creative writing. Did that time inspire your own writing or did it block your creativity? Um, I couldn't say it inspires it, but I do enjoy it. I like it. I, I'm very interested in uh, I, I'm interested in the developing work of new writers. And, you know, there's always one or two in any group and you just know they're born writers and that's I find that very exciting yeah I I do enjoy mentoring to so you know um so I, my most I I've done I've taught at Maynooth and Galway and then at Carlow University Pittsburgh I worked with them during the summers for 11 years in Dublin and um most recently for the Irish Writers Centre as well and I think woman. Um, if I may add my own question in there as a woman I think it's so important for other women to mentor so, you know, you said it was a lot of men getting published before you when you started out. Do you think that situation is still the same and can? No, not at all. I think it has changed utterly. It's a totally different landscape now. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, sometimes I sometimes I have to search for the men men's voices, to be honest. It has, you know, it's very different now, but uh, I'm not I'm not really. However, I'm not entirely sure what's happening, so I wouldn't be too categorical about it but I, I do like it in a workshop if I have men in that group because I prefer the balance that we get from it, it's just interesting to to have men in the group as well um rather than an all women group to me that's how I find it yeah, I think it's important that everybody's voices are represented together yeah, yeah very world. Um, someone else has asked, do you write every day and do you have a ritual at the same desk and same time or do you kind of wait for that muse to strike? Well, I'm, I, this interview is taking place at the desk in the room that I work in. So it's just the room that's set aside for it. And um, but um, when I I'm not writing every day at the moment, but when I write, I write in the mornings um, and I find I can't do any more than a couple of hours, maybe three hours, and then I'm quite tired. Um, mm. Years ago, I would have been able to go on for six hours, you know, <laughs> when I wrote my first novel. It's quite funny, uh, but, you know, the energy isn't the same now. So you learn how to husband it differently, to use that strange gendery word. Um, and uh, yeah, I would just, same place, same desk, 
very boring sometimes. Let there be no doubt about that. But yet I love it. And I, I know but the last poem I'm going to, to ask you to read it is based on a, a travels. Um, so do you find when you travel, it inspires you? Do you write when you travel or do you write when you come home and reflect on what happened over the travels? Um, yeah, usually it usually some months after I come home, you know, things have processed and fallen into place. And I realize, yeah, maybe I had some sort of reaction to that and want to talk about it a bit, you know. Um. I, and this is um, a couple of great questions here, actually. Um, how important is the accessibility of meaning? Do you think someone should have to work hard to solve, in quotation marks, solve a poem? Mm, that, that is hard. That, in a way, that's hard to answer. Like, it depends who you're reading. It's probably a little bit like certain types of visual art. You need to come back and look at them three, four, five times sometimes. And then some poems are very accessible. And um, I'm reading a really wonderful poet at the moment called Leanne Quinn and her, her collection, Some Lives. Now, I, I don't know her at all very well, but that's a poet whose work you come back to again and again because it doesn't always yield. But that's, that is a good thing in good poetry. I don't, you know, that is a really good thing, I think. Um, so it, it does depend on, on the poet's personality and all sorts of things. I definitely remember in, in secondary school, we had a, a wonderful English teacher, God rest his soul. And um, what I thought was fascinating was he had a great knowledge of all the Latin and Greek myths and things like that. And I, what fascinated me and drew me into poetry was when he would explain all the things that weren't obvious in the poem, that all the metaphor that you didn't understand. And it was like this coded language that we were learning. And it, that's what I thought was, what I suppose what fascinated me with poetry as a, as a teenager in school. It, it, yeah, I, I was a bit like that. I didn't mind um, having to have, you know, if you didn't get all the in all the inbuilt stuff, which you don't, you know, you, you can't always. It's great if someone will enlighten you, <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. Um, another brilliant question here is, has a poem ever humbled or frightened you? What was it? When did it happen? And what did you do afterwards? <laughs> A poem that I've written myself or that I've read? I didn't specify, unfortunately, but either. Yeah, that's a, mm, uh, it's, uh, I can't answer that off the top of my head. I'm sure. Um, I yeah, mean, I, I, I remember, I can't remember the name of this poem now at all. I know it's by Paula Meehan mm -hmm. and it's one in which she's talking about um it's talk she's talking about how she has written about I think how she's written about her mother and then she's throwing the blame on herself as the poet like well isn't it well for me with my education and my poetry to be able to do this sort of thing do you know that that she suddenly recognizes that as as a poet or as a very literate person she has a sort of a unconsciously superior position and can take family experience away and analyze it as I have done too. You know, we all do it. And so it is, it was humbling to read the honesty of that uh, mm. because that is the truth. Writers go off, um, we, you know, we take ourselves off and go off into a little corner and write all kinds of stuff about all kinds of situations, experiences and people. Um, who may not want to or can't have any need to do the same. And um, that, that I found that humbling. It made me think. Yeah, because I, I do think the best writing attacks, attacks the most difficult subjects and the things that are the hardest to say. And obviously the people involved in that, be they family or acquaintances or friends or lovers, might not want them said about them. <laughs> so it is, I think it's very brave to to attack those subjects as, as you do. Well, I suppose in general, you see, you don't even think of it as, a, as an attack so much as um, it's a dialogue, it's a conversation really, it's an exploration. And that is what I am more interested in. Um, well, except for maybe in the poem, it wasn't a woman, but um, I, I think that li life is there uh, to be investigated on a quasi philosophical level as well. And that, that would be my background and, you know, I suppose intellectually. And um, I think it's about exploring and it's just one person, one writer's way of doing it. 
you know, we're all just scraps of dust and it means nothing in the in the long term. That's the truth. Um, I've just just take two more uh, two more comments or questions here. Um, one is a comment from Eilish Nigwizna who said, I remember being at a book launch and books upstairs when Jesse met Mary and said, I'll publish Lou. <laughs> and then from Anne, um, she would like to know in a, in a nutshell, we just have a couple of minutes left, is how do you approach editing a poem? Well, that's the part that I really love, to be honest. It's my favorite part. Um, I just rewrite and rewrite and rewrite as needed. Um, I, I usually do the first draft into the laptop and then I print it out, have a good look at it and start uh, with a pencil or pen changing things and then input it again. And that could go on maybe for 15 or more drafts until I have it as right as I can make it. But, you know, people often ask about the, di the difference between inspiration and craft. And I think the inspiration occurs within the craft when you are editing and redrafting. So that gives me more pleasure than any other part of writing or publishing. Yeah, actually, um, that, that really reminds me of um, Sarah Bohm's book, Handiwork, where she's discussing craft and she'll be actually appearing later this evening. So it's an interesting um, Fabulous book yeah. That, she, yeah, that she covered in that. Um, I think we are running out of time now. Unfortunately, Mary, it has been so lovely to talk to you. But just before we finish up, I know that there is one time for one more poem. We can always make time. And I think telling a friend about reading Lorca in the Alhambra was one that you were very keen to, to read for us. So Yes, thank you. Um, it's just about happiness, you know. This was happiness, I said. We talked, we talked about the quick, perfect stealth of those moments. I sat beneath orange trees and the ground breathed up on me, a gentle possession a lover long known, rarely seen. And later, when the sun had set that day, a full moon stealing over the Sierras, I thought of going to Santiago de Cuba, as he had done, of dancing to Cuban rhythms, rum on my tongue, a reek of skin, all body burning up because Lorca, you know, he went to Cuba and New York and, oh God, he seemed, his poems are so happy from that period. I think that's uh, something we can all read and dream about traveling again. Yeah, <laughs> One day. I hope so. Thank Great you. For you for Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure and I wish you the very best and I hope we can welcome you here next year in real life. It would be great to have you down. Oh, it would be fun. It really would. Thank you. And thank you everyone, Gurmila Mahagwiv, for watching uh, Fon Ling. Big, uh, there will be more events um, kicking off at three o'clock um, and we hope to see you there. Sloan.